The next speaker is Amanda Fielding. She's the, the founder of the, the Beckley and Beckley Foundation, which um, yeah, has a campaign for drug policy reform with focus on advising governments across Latin America. And uh, most importantly, the scientific research and the benefits on drugs. So Amanda, good luck. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here and um, I hope you will forgive me if I read my talk because I'm a very um, nervous public speaker and I prefer to kind of get the words right so I'll read it. Um, in this talk I would like to reflect on the internal and external effects of psychoactive substances and how the Beckley Foundation works to explore and rationalize both spheres of activity. The terrible harms caused by our misconceived drug policies are based on the misconception that it is possible to prohibit man's desire to alter his consciousness and eliminate those substances which bring about these changes in ways considered immoral or dangerous by the authorities. The prohibition of these psychoactive compounds have played such a central role in the development of human culture has caused devastating suffering worldwide. It is also fascinating to observe that the repressive mechanisms inside the brain called by Freud the ego and the superego, and now in modern neuroscientific terminology called the default mode network, is projected into the external world in the form of the state, and indeed the superstate, the UN. It is also interesting that the so-called controlled substances, i.e. those substances not approved of by the establishment have the effect of reducing the control of the ego or the default mode network within the brain of the individual. This loosening of control is experienced by the state, the external manifestation of the ego, as a threat to its very existence. The Beckley Foundation, which I set up in 1998, works at both improving global drug policy and exploring the mechanisms of the mind as the two are irrevocably intertwined. After discussing international drug policy, I will talk about the Beckley's recent research into the effects of psychedelics on the default mode network and how for the first time we have demonstrated how a psychedelic reduces the blood flow to the centers of the default mode network and thereby reduces its filtering and censoring mechanisms. But first, back to global drug policy. The good news is that finally the citadel of prohibition is beginning to crumble. In the heartland of prohibition, in November 2012, voters in Colorado and Washington state voted for the state to set up a legal market in cannabis for non-medical use. Uruguay is doing likewise. These initiatives clearly contravene the UN 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. A few weeks ago, the government of New Zealand passed a bill which will permit the sale of new psychoactive substances which have been certified to be safe for human consumption. Under this new system, manufacturers and retailers would bear the cost of proving safety. This is a great breakthrough for regulation and the only sensible way to deal with the ever-growing influx of new psychoactive substances appearing for sale through the internet and head shops. But most important of all, governments in Latin America have lost patience and are beginning to demand for freedom to break away from the failed prohibitionist policies that have made their countries virtual war zones. 
For the last year, I've been in the fortunate position of being the advisor on drug policy to President Otto Perez Molina of Guatemala and his government. And he has become the leading global spokesman for drug policy reform. In June this year, the Organization of American States, consisting of, five, uh, consisting of 35 countries, including the USA, held its General Assembly in Guatemala, hosted by President Molina. In their final declaration, the assembled foreign ministers declared for the first time that they encourage the consideration of new approaches to the world war problem of drugs in the, in the Americas based on scientific knowledge and evidence. That they encourage broad and open debate on the world drug problem and that, they, and that drug policies must have a cross-cutting human rights perspective. These are totally new concepts for intergovernmental organizations to consider. Last October, again following pressure from Latin American leaders, the United Nations General Assembly agreed to hold a special session on drugs in 2016. We must all work to create enough pressure, both from the higher echelons of power and from the grassroots, to ensure that this General Assembly makes more progress than the 1998 special session on drugs. That meeting had as its slogan the catchy phrase, a drug-free world, we can do it. In 1998, I founded the Beckley Foundation with a double-headed program of science and policy with the dual aims of one, reforming global drug policy by creating evidence-informed policies based on health, harm reduction, cost-effectiveness, and human rights. And two, investigating consciousness and its changing states, in particular those brought about by psychoactive substances, and how such states can benefit the individual and mankind more generally. Compared with the present day, 1998 was in the stone ages regarding drug policy. There was no attempt to base policy on any scientific evidence. In fact, no one ever thought of collecting any evidence, simply. All controlled drugs were, by definition, a scourge of civilization. In policy talk, all drug use was misuse. There was no evidence that approximately 90% of drug-using population did so with no problems to themselves or others. There was no differentiation between different categories of drugs. There was no scale of harm between different types of drugs and certainly no, harm, no scale of benefits. Indeed, there was no recognition that users could experience any benefits. There was just the determination to eliminate all controlled drugs from the face of the earth, an utterly unrealistic aspiration doomed to failure. How amazing. What other organization, apart from, perhaps, the National Security Administration, could spend $100 billion a year, decade after decade, with no audit of success or failure. However, the bureaucratic head office don't mind, as it is the poor, sweaty taxpayers of the world who finance this lunacy. In 1998, having collected a very impressive list of scientific advisors, I set about trying to form an evidence base for drug policy by investigating key policy issues. For this, the Beckley Foundation commissioned and published around 40 much-cited academic reports and organized a series of influential meetings entitled Drugs and Society, A Rational Perspective, mainly held at the House of Lords in London. These seminars brought together key scientists, policy experts, and politicians in order to develop policy ideas and influence and educate thought leaders.
In 2003, I discussed with Professor Colin Blakemore the need for a scale of harm for all social drugs, which would compare controlled drugs with alcohol and tobacco. He presented papers on the subject to the Beckley Foundation conferences of 2003 and 2004, and this was later developed by Professor David Nutt, who wrote the much-cited paper published in The Lancet in 2007. And this shows how um, the regulation of drugs have absolutely nothing to do with scientific ev evidence. Um, in 2006, I noticed the extraordinary fact that cannabis although accounting for 80% of the market in illegal drugs, was never mentioned at national or international fora. Cannabis was the elephant in the room, the hidden mainstay of the war on drugs. I decided to create the Beckley Foundation Global Commission on Cannabis with leading establishment academics. This resulted in the 2008 report, later co-published with Oxford University Press, entitled Cannabis Policy Moving Beyond Stalemate. This was very influential in altering opinion. Now, even the UN recognizes that cannabis will be regulated. However, in order to form a legal regulated market in one or more drugs, the UN conventions of 1961, 71, and 88 must be amended. In 2010, while disseminating the cannabis report in Washington, D.C. and Latin America, I realized that the latter would be the motor of reform. I then decided to create the Global Initiative of Drug Policy Reform. This initiative was launched at the House of Lords in London in 2011. It consisted of bringing together high-level representatives from countries which had undertaken reform, such as Portugal, the Czech Republic, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, countries interested in reform, and representatives from the Global Commission on Drug Policy Reform. For the initiative, I commissioned two new reports. The first, Roadmaps to Reforming the UN Drug Conventions, which describes how the conventions could be amended in order to, be, to, mit, to permit clear decriminalization and full regulation of one or more controlled drug. And the second report, towards a cost-benefit analysis of a regulated and taxed cannabis market in the UK and Wales which would give the economic advantages of such a um, regulated market. To coincide with the launch of the Beckley's Global Initiative, we published the Beckley Foundation public letter calling for new drug policies, which was signed by seven former presidents, including Jimmy Carter, two ruling presidents by 12 Nobel laureates and dozens of other global notables including Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Naam Chomsky. Following the publication of the letter in spring 2012, I was invited by President Otto Perez Molina to visit him in Guatemala in order to set up the Beckley Foundation Latin American chapter to advise him and his government on how to reform drug policy so as to lower violence and corruption. Towards that aim, in January of this year, I presented the President with our report, Paths for Reform, which outlines ideas and new approaches, including the regulation to the currently illegal poppy crop and move towards the regulation of cannabis and other psychoactive substances in order to remove profits from the criminal cartels and increase security in a war-torn country. The President announced some of these suggestions at Davos and other international fora. I also advised the President to convene a summit of Latin American presidents to be chaired by Jimmy Carter. This summit will take place in November of this year at the Mayan Pyramid of Tikal in Guatemala, the highest building in pre-Columbian America. <laughs> 
The idea of the Tikal Summit has now developed to include a meeting of presidents and global business leaders. There will be a Tikal declaration and a high-level representation from international media. The meeting of presidents will be chaired by President Jimmy Carter, and the second meeting, including business leaders, will be chaired by George Soros. President Otto Perez Molina and President Santos of Colombia have emerged as the world's leading advocates of global drug policy reform. Molina was a military man who, for 20 years, led the fight against the cartels. In this time, he came to the realization that the war on drugs is unwinnable, i.e., the cartels got richer and richer, while Guatemala and its neighbors became war zones with enormous cost to life, national security, health, and development. Guatemala and its neighboring countries formed the transit route for cocaine grown in the south and destined for the nostrils of the world's largest consumer, the USA. The ill-conceived prohibitionist policies of the last 50 years have caused devastating harms far in excess of the harms attributed to the drugs themselves. Black market money spreads like a corrupting cancer through the economy of the world. Misconceived drug policies cause, in my opinion, more suffering than any other policy initiative, suffering which could be alleviated with new, rational approaches. Before the 1960s, the use of psychoactive substances was mainly localized with indigenous cultures and a few groups of intellectuals and artists. For example, in India, cannabis use was associated with spirituality and the priestly caste, with Shiva and the sadhus, and opium with the warrior caste. From the earliest recorded times, cannabis, the coca leaf, and opium were all valued for their medicinal properties. Until the 20th century, drug use was regional and not a major problem worldwide. The only exception to this was in China, when in the 18th century, the British had become large-scale drug dealers. They highly valued Chinese imports, such as tea, silk, and porcelain. But the Chinese authorities insisted on payment in silver. The British got the silver back by selling opium, thereby creating a plague of addiction. In the, 50, in the 1750s, the British conquered the poppy-growing territory of Bengal and greatly expanded the illegal trade in spite of the Chinese ban on opium imports. The lineage of modern global drug control dates back to the early 20th century with the signing of the first International Opium Convention in The Hague in 1912. However, it was the United Nations Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs of 1961 that established the global prohibitionist system. Naturally, America was the motor behind this initiative. This convention was designed to eradicate the production and cultivation, the trade, distribution, possession, and consumption of opium, coca, and cannabis. Indeed, the convention states explicitly that even the traditional indigenous uses of these substances must be eliminated within 25 years. The conventions were not based on evidence, but rather vested interests, paranoia, and discrimination against foreign minorities. Plus the urge by some to replace the profitable prohibition of alcohol with the prohibition of other substances. It is an ironic fact that the worldwide explosion in the use of psychoactive substances took place after this convention was adopted. Like the prohibition of alcohol in the USA, the Convention of 1961 and the subsequent UN drug treaties of 71 and 88 
have been deeply counterproductive. Prohibition has generated a vast criminal underworld, controlling what may be the third largest industry in the world, after food and oil, and a well worth well in excess of 300 billion each year. These vast profits allow the cartels to fund terrorist groups and to corrupt institutions of state, including politicians, the police, the army, and the judiciary, especially in the producer and transit countries, such as much of South and Central America, Afghanistan, and now West Africa. It also enables government agencies to have access to invisible funds for hidden agenda. It is a cancer which is destroying our civilization. Here are a few statistics that illustrate the folly of the world's current prohibitionist approach to drugs. One, the war on drugs costs over $100 billion each year. The US federal drug control budget for this year, excluding spending by individual states, is $24.5 billion twice the entire budget of the UK Home Office. Two, prohibition kills tens of thousands of people each year. When Felipe Calderon was president of Mexico between 2006 and 2012 and decided to fight the cartels with all the forces of the state, over 60,000 people died in drug wars in Mexico alone. Three, Millions of people around the world are in prison for drugs offenses, mostly users and small-scale mules. In the USA, in 2009, there were 1.3 million drug arrests, more than 80% of which were for simple possession. In California, the prison industry is one of the biggest growth industries, consuming minorities like the Carthaginian god Moloch. The arrest for the arrest and incarceration figures mask a scandal of discrimination. Although African Americans comprise 14% of regular drug users in the US, they are 37% of those arrested for drug offenses and 57% of those incarcerated for drug crimes. In the UK, Stop and search powers are used nearly seven times more frequently against ethnic minorities than against whites. Five, because of the severe limits placed on the production and control, uh, the production of controlled drugs, around 80% of the world's population have little or no access to essential painkilling medicines such as morphine. The richest 20% of people consume 94% of all legally produced morphine. The remaining 80% of the world's population consume approximately 6% and so are obliged to endure acute and unmitigated pain with no help of analgesics. Six, the prohibition of controlled substances has for the for last 40 years blocked scientific research into their potential usefulness, thereby depriving patients of potentially valuable treatments. It was in order to overcome this block that I set up the Beckley Foundation Scientific Program, which has resulted in the pioneering work carried out by the Beckley Foundation in collaboration with institutions around the world. In 2012, it became obvious to me that the only way to seriously reduce the violence and corruption in Latin America was to take the vastly profitable business of cocaine out of the hands of criminals. Towards that purpose, I suggested to the President Perez Molina that the Beckley Foundation's next report should be on the regulation of cocaine. He was enthusiastic about the idea. Amazingly, no one has dared to approach this essential but taboo subject. The aim is to do for cocaine what the report Cannabis Policy Moving Beyond Stalemate did for cannabis, i.e. 
open up and legitimize the debate and create the space for careful experimentation. The debate will, at some stage, need to focus on the reform of the international drug conventions to allow individual countries more freedom to develop policies better suited to their known needs. We talk in our reports of the importance of evidence-informed policies, yet the conventions insist on worldwide prohibition and criminalization, stifling policy experimentation so that it is impossible to create an evidence base, particularly on regulation, which to the UN is totally taboo. Countries need to recognize that the UN conventions are not the word of God. They were conceived in a different era under the influence of many prejudices and vested interests, and they desperately need to be reformed to allow much greater flexibility and experimentation of different approaches, particularly within national borders. To conclude, the UN needs to recognize that there have been fundamental changes since the single convention was adopted in 1961. The use of drugs has rocketed around the world. HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C have emerged and are taking a devastating and disproportionate toll on injecting drug users. Such substances as cannabis, MDMA, and magic mushrooms have been scientifically shown to be less harmful than alcohol and tobacco, and also to have valuable medicinal properties. We need to rethink our approach to how best to minimize the harms coming from the production, transit, and use of psychoactive substances, and discard the sledgehammer approach of the one-size-fits-all, and replace it with a more nuanced approach tailored to the needs of different drugs at the different stages of the supply chain and the needs of the different countries and, indeed, the needs of different individuals. We need to develop systems of regulation which will minimize harms at each link in the chain. It has been a long, hard struggle swimming against the tide but finally, the cracks in the citadel of prohibition are opening up, and bit by bit, the walls of fear, taboo, and dogmatism are crumbling away. Let us work together to replace this ossified armor with a more intelligent, subtle, and flexible structure whose success is judged not by the number of people incarcerated, the tons of substances confiscated, or the hectares defoliated, but rather by human health and happiness, security, development, and education. I will now move on to the second part of my talk which will discuss the scientific program of the Beckley Foundation. I think there has been a terrible mistake in the way in which modern society has dealt with the control of psychoactive substances. Substances traditionally hailed sacred and called the flesh of the gods. It is perhaps an interesting example of the insanity of man how can we explain why the upright talking ape, which shares 99% of his genes with his closest cousin, the gorilla, combine such astonishing cleverness with such insane blindness to reality? The answer to this paradox is hidden in the nature of the human ego, or, as we now call it, the default mode network. Traditionally, Psychoactive substances have been at the core of human development, inspiring the flowering of language, art, music, spirituality, and medicine. Why should modern man decide to prohibit and criminalize these amazing compounds which act so synergetically with the human nervous system? <clears throat> 
The fact is that the individual and its projection, society as a whole, can gain from the experiences of loosening internal control. By journeying to the wilder shores of consciousness, the shaman brings back insights for the group. Loosening the grip of conventional control, breaking the conventions, thinking outside the box, can be of benefit to society. As Einstein put it, no problem can be solved with the thinking that you use to create it. In a more modern context, Steve Jobs claimed his experiences of LSD inspired creative breakthroughs. Each great thinker is breaking the thought conventions of the past and opening up new pathways of understanding. The psychedelics help break down the restrictions of the past and open the doors for new perceptions and associations. It is an ironic and tragic fact that society has taken upon itself to criminalize one of humanity's major tools to reduce the internal system of repressive control, psychoactive substances. It is surely a basic human right to control one's own level of consciousness as long as it is causing no harm to others. George Washington and his mates when drawing up the Constitution, never thought of including the right of determining one's own consciousness, as, most likely, they thought this right was self-evident. Health and happiness are basic human rights, and many would argue that the responsible use of certain psychoactive substances are a part of that process. The drug laws interfere not only with the rights of the individual, but also with the scientific exploration of how these substances might, might have the potential to improve health and overcome sickness. After decades in the wilderness, psychedelic science is finally experiencing a renaissance as the taboo on scientific research is being broken down. The research being carried out by the Beckley Foundation and others around the world is starting to bear valuable fruit, not only in our understanding of brain function and consciousness, but, very importantly, also in terms of new clinical applications. At last, I feel we're on the cusp of great discoveries. I look on brain imaging as an artwork, like the great art of Egypt, of Egypt, it is beauty with a meaning. Brain imaging studies are an ideal complement to clinical trials. They provide new discoveries that drive medical advances, as well as new explanations that give medical research a powerful neuroscientific underpinning. Back in 1966, Shortly after I was first introduced to LSD, I became passionately, one could say compulsively, interested in the physiologic, physiological mechanisms underlying altered states of consciousness and the ego. I had got together with a Dutch scientist of exceptional insight, Bart Hugues, who had developed two new interrelated hypotheses one concerning the irrigation of the brain and the changes in blood supply to the brain underlying altered states of consciousness, and the second describing the physiological basis of the ego as a conditioned reflex mechanism based on word recognition which directs blood to those brain centers most essential for survival while restricting blood flow to other brain centers. This was the first time that a mechanistic explanation of the ego had been given. It also provided the first explanation of how brain functioning can be altered by such practices as meditation, yogic breathing, and the ingestion of psychoactive substances, to name but a few. The underlying theory was that these practices brought about a change in blood supply to the brain together with a loosening of the repressive control of the ego mechanisms over consciousness. 
This new explanation of the ego, the system superimposed as the rest of the brain, could, however, not be tested in those days. Thanks to the development of more advanced brain imaging technologies over recent years, and particularly fMRI in the early 1990s, it has now become possible to observe the changes in blood supply and brain function that correlate with changes in subjective experience during altered states of consciousness. My passion was to investigate the hypotheses inspired by Bart and to discover to what extent they were true or not. This motivated me to set up the Beckley Foundation in 1998 to enable me to access, access the latest brain imaging technologies. I invited some of the world's leading scientists, including Albert Hoffman, Sasha Shulgin, Colin Blakemore, Dave Nutt, Les Iverson, David Nichols, and Raman Chandran, among others, to form a scientific advisory board. Over the years, I set up a network of collaborations, and in 2007, Professor Dave Nutt and I embarked on a collaborative program of research. I was keen to start with psychedelics, but Dave advised caution, so we first started with cannabis. In 2009, when Dave moved from Bristol to Imperial College London, we set up the Beckley Imperial Psychopharmacological Research Program and started a series of pilot studies. These included a series of studies involving the administration of psilocybin, the active principle of the magic mushroom, to healthy volunteers. These studies were coordinated by young postdoctoral researcher Robin K. Hart Harris. The program has proved to be a dream come true. With very little funding, we have initiated a program of pioneering research which has produced both surprising and exciting findings. Contrary to our expectation, particularly mine, we found that compared with placebo, psilocybin decreases blood flow and brain activity particularly in the network of highly interconnected brain regions known as the default mode network. All the data showed reductions in blood flow and neural activity to this important network. Interestingly, the magnitude of the reduction correlated with the strength of the subjective experience. The default mode network, or DMN, as it is called, closely corresponds with Bart Huger's conception of the ego as a top-down controlling mechanism. The brain is not a free-for-all among independent systems, but a federation of interdependent components that are hierarchically organized. The DMN sits at the top of this hierarchy, exerting a top-down control on activity in other brain regions, that feed their information into this network to be either repressed or rooted onwards. The censoring activity of this superimposed mechanism closely reflects Audless Huxley's metaphor of the brain as the reducing valve, as well as Bart's description of the ego as a conditioned reflex mechanism which censors what is allowed to enter consciousness awareness and what is not. As in Bart's model of the ego, the development of the default mode network begins after infancy, during the time when language and self-control are being acquired through conditioning. To summarize, the default mode network comprises high-level cortical nodes that are highly connected to each other and to subcortical systems. These centers include the medial prefrontal cortex, and the posterior cingulate cortex, as well as parts of the thal thalamus and other areas. In our research, we found that psilocybin acts by constricting the blood flow to the blood in the default mode network and thereby decreases its controlling and repressive activity. Thus, sensory and emotional impulses, which would normally be repressed, can now reach consciousness and uses experience as spontaneous and more unconstrained mode of thinking. <laughs>
a more fluid and plastic state of consciousness. This state more readily allows access of the brain's of access to the areas of the brain normally kept repressed, e.g., traumatic memories, spiritual awareness, and creativity. Most important, the subjective intensity of the psychedelic experience reflects the extent to which the activity of the default mode network is reduced. It is worth noting that the centers of the default mode network whose blood flow and activity are particularly reduced by psilocybin include the medial prefrontal and the posterior cingulate. Interestingly, it has been observed that in people suffering from depression, the, med the medial prefrontal cortex exhibits both chronically raised activity and increased connectivity with the posterior cingular cortex. This hyperactivity is linked to the thinking becoming rigid and inflexible, leading to an endless cycle of self-obsessed negative rumination. Our findings suggest that the drug may provide a valuable new avenue of treatment for depression, hopefully allowing the rigidity of the negative patterns of thought to be broken up and reset in new, more constructive formation. Recognizing the value of this research, the UK's Medical Research Council has awarded us over half a million pounds for a clinical trial to further investigate the use of psilocybin as a treatment for depression. Our brain imaging study into the effects of psilocybin is the first time that anyone has shown that the most basic effect of psychedelics is to re reduce blood flow to the default mode network, thereby lessening the grip of the control mechanism and permitting a looser style of awareness to surface into consciousness. This would explain why the psychedelics are conducive not only to accessing repressed memories and alleviating depression, but also to experiencing mystical states, to enhance creativity and to seeing the unity and interconnectedness of all things and our place in the greater whole. All of these characteristics can enhance the nobler aspects of the human personality. Thus, our research studies with both psilocybin and MDMA have gone a long way to giving a neuroscientific explanation as to why these compounds can be such valuable aids in psychotherapy whether it is overcoming post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, or anxiety associated with a terminal illness. By facilitating access to repressed memories, the psychedelics allow the patient to develop more constructive ways of coping with their trauma, thereby freeing them from their unconscious grip and creating a renewed sense of self. A really exciting recent development is obtaining ethical approvals for our LSD study. I've been waiting to do this research for over 40 years, and now finally that dream is coming true. Many years ago, I promised Albert Hoffman that, as a hundredth birthday present, I would open the doors of scientific research into his beloved elixir. This study will investigate what are the physiological and neural mechanisms underlying the subjective effects of LSD? What are the different effects of, at different doses? What mental and physical health conditions might be treated with LSD? And how LSD might potentiate creativity, problem solving, synesthesia, and other related phenomena? Imagine the excitement of the business world if it should be demonstrated that a small dose of LSD can increase our ability to solve problems and indeed make money. As many of you here are computer specialists, I would love to ask for your help in developing creativity tests which would catch that elusive quality of enhanced creativity associated with LSD.
Over the years, I've collaborated with a number of institutions around the world, many of which have been very productive. In one such study, I'm collaborating with Roland Griffiths' wonderful group at Johns Hopkins in the USA, in which we are conducting the first study in modern times to harness the power of, psychedelic, of a psychedelic to assist in the treatment of addiction, in this case, addiction to nicotine. The protocol uses an intensive course of psychotherapy, including three sessions with psilocybin. Initial results have been absolutely remarkable, with every participant quitting smoking and remaining verifiably absent on follow-up. There has been no return to regular smoking. This success rate is far in advance of any other method of treating addiction. I'm also currently in the process of developing a program of research into the manifold properties of ayahuasca. I'm very fortunate to be working with some of the best and most dedicated scientists in the world, many of whom have access to the latest brain imaging technology. I'm also enormously grateful to the far-sighted and trusting funders who have given the indispensable donations without which we cannot do the work. I feel the Beckley Foundation is now in a unique position to carry out cutting-edge research in this most important area of human development, consciousness research. By great good luck, I find myself in a secret garden with an orchard of trees heavy with low-hanging fruit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda, for this lecture. We got uh, still 10 minutes left. Maybe there, are, maybe there are people here who would like to ask Amanda a few questions. Do you think that affects that psychedelics are a very good treatment against addiction is a really political thing because our economy is very much based on creating addictions and psychedelics are very good at cutting through addiction so here we've got really our force against us and uh, being able to be free to experience that we are all one uh, because we want people have an uh, interest in keeping us addicted. Do you think this is a political force? So that's my question. So what, what was your question exactly? That the, the economic forces yeah. that rely on addiction yeah. will not really be happy yeah. with being psychedelics being open and right. having us not being addicted. Yeah, well that's quite possible. I mean we've been doing this pilot study at John Hopkins now for four years, six years. We've got amazing results such as never been equaled in any other study on addiction and so far um, you know the government bodies in America have not given us grant to make it a much bigger study. And that's why one's dependent on individual funding to um, enlarge the research base. So I think you're quite right. I think uh, they don't like the use of psychedelics because the difference is in treating um, diseases, normally you're giving medication every day, whereas with psychedelics you're just using it two or three times. Yeah. And that's not good for the pharmaceutical industry. Also, I think that the outcome of the research saying that taking psilocybin in that case is the only uh, way of changing the experience of adult people, the, yes. the mystical experience, basically. Yes. I think yes. that that's a very important outcome that we yeah. should get to all the people here, actually. Absolutely. That's a very important part. And also sufferers of cluster headaches yes. have found that um, LSD and psilocybin 
are the only things which um, stop them having those terrible or help yeah. stop them. Yeah. And again, um, there's not been any study allowed on that yet. Yeah. But I do think the doors to open up the study is beginning to happen because we're beginning to get positive yeah. evidence. So yes. it's more difficult for the ethical boards to block our research. Yeah. But the other thing which blocks research is that it's impossible to get the products to do the research with because they have to have such high um, health measures, GMP it's called, good um, medical governance, so, so high that it costs thousands, almost a hundred thousand pounds to get medication which you could, you know, get for a few, a couple of thousand normally. So that's another way of blocking research. Yeah, and also obviously by uh, uh, supporting negative research and blocking positive research, yes. uh, and that's also a way of... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do think we're beginning to break through. Yeah, yeah, process. and I think the conference you, you, you uh, referred to when Albert uh, became 100 years old yes. was a very nice experience for all of us, and it yeah. was very great that you announced that this... Uh, research, and I, I definitely think that research is the way we should go. But so I thank you very much for uh, for your you. initiative, also. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, Last you question. Uh, I'm interrupting you. I'm over here. Thank you. Last question. Uh, if people got questions afterwards, we could go to the media cafe. Amanda will be uh, willing there to answer your questions. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> um, considering the but parts uh, that you presented from the scientific side, the role of the default mode ne network um, and its uh, its relation or how the default mode network changes, um, for instance, uh, under um, influence of, of psilocybin, uh, is there? Is it possible to, to do some research on how that would relate to, um, let's say, when, when um, no, uh, how, how somebody, so I took this from the title of your talk, um, that you would relate it also to the way, um, um, no, sorry, <laughs> got to get to the point. Um, well, anyway, how, how would, um, uh, for instance, the reception of news um, yeah. alter the, 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 the working of, uh, so how would the default mode network be involved in, in yes. how we receive things, how we relate to things, right. messages, etc. Absolutely. And take that together with how some substances would yeah. interfere with that. Yeah. Is, there, is there something that can be researched? I, 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 think, I think the default mode network is one of the most fascinating new um, neuroscientific discoveries. I mean, it's, it's just a different way of explaining the ego, superego, but it gives it a neurobiological basis. And I think our research is just the very, very first step in this um, discovery. And I think it's a very fascinating discovery. It's like a double negative. We're getting more stimulation through the psychedelics by turning off the negative inhibitory, inhibitory um, control system. So it's not what I obviously first expected, which was increased activity, but it's turning down the repressive activity. And I think we need lots more research on the default mode network, also with using LSD and cannabis and a lot of other substances to see how they affect it. And how the speech centers are involved in the network. And indeed, I, I cut out, but it's a very interesting thing, because there are other, there's another system called the task positive network, which balances the default mode network. And these together form the ego, and they're anti-correlated, but the psychedelic breaks down the anti-correlated issues, so they work together and that explains why, under a psychedelic, you feel um, that the um, division between the inside and outside worlds has um, been faded away. And, I mean, there's a lot of very fascinating things around 
studying. I mean, I think um, the psychedelics enable one to learn so much about consciousness because as opposed to studying ordinary consciousness with um, um, illness, psychosis, we're enabled to study ordinary consciousness with an enhanced, altered state of consciousness. And therefore we can learn much more about what is the potential of consciousness. And so in the LSD study, I really want to widen it to include how can we test if it propensiates creativity, which after all is a kind of basic human um, ability. And I think if one could show that LSD, as I think it does, does propensiate creativity, it, it's a very strong reason why it shouldn't be criminalized. So I think the science and the policy intertwine very satisfactorily. And it's, anyway, a good area. I hope that slightly answers what you were saying. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, keep up the work, please. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.